Hey Star Trek fans, welcome to another episode of Dan's Disco Deep Dives, in which I take a look at the Easter eggs, hidden bits, canon connections, and theories for new episodes of Star Trek Discovery. This week, Season 2, Episode 12, Through the Valley of Shadows. The episode was written by Bo Yon Kim and Erica Leipold, their third Star Trek Discovery script, following Season 1's Into the Forest I Go and this season's The Sound of Thunder. They also wrote the Short Treks episode, The Brightest Star. Through the Valley of Shadows is the third Discovery episode to be directed by Douglas Arniokoski. The primary setting for the Pike part of this episode is Boreth, a Klingon world briefly visited earlier this season in Point of Light, with the events of that episode referenced in this one. Boreth is home to a Klingon monastery where monks await the return of Kalis, who said that he would reappear one day while pointing to the star that Boreth orbits. The planet and monastery were both seen in the TNG episode Rightful Heir, in which the prophecy is seemingly fulfilled when Kalis appears to Worf, who is undertaking a pilgrimage to the Boreth monastery. While the monastery's secondary function as a repository of time crystals was never mentioned before, it makes sense that this would be kept a secret from pilgrims who are there only to worship Kalos. Chancellor Lorel meets up with the Discovery in orbit of Boreth, carried there by one of the Klingon Empire's brand new D7 class battlecruisers. The D7 was the mainstay of the Klingon fleet in the original Star Trek series, and the reimagining of it is first seen in this episode after having been teased in Point of Light. The new D7 cruiser is a new design meant to unify the Empire under a single fleet rather than the myriad ship designs we saw in Season 1, controlled by various houses of the fractured Klingon Empire. We learn in this episode that Klingons have experimented with time travel technology via the time crystals before, but deemed them too dangerous a weapon to use. Interestingly, this is not the first time in Star Trek lore that Klingons have been linked to time travel experimentation. In the final episode of Star Trek Voyager, Admiral Catherine Janeway appropriates a piece of technology called a chrono deflector from the Klingon scientist named Korath and uses it to travel back in time to assist the USS Voyager in returning to the Alpha Quadrant after seven years in the Delta Quadrant. In what is probably a coincidence, the chrono deflector emits a green energy beam that looks to be about the same color as the time crystals found on Boreth. On Boreth, we meet one of the timekeepers, a Klingon by the name of Tanavik. It turns out that he is the son of Vok and Lorel, and his close proximity to the time crystals have meant that he doesn't experience time the same way that most people do, hence why he is now fully grown. Also of note, Tanavik is played by Kenneth Mitchell, who previously played Cole of House Kor in Season 1, and his father, Kolshaw, earlier this season in the episode Point of Light. While Pike is on Boreth attempting to procure a time crystal, Burnham and Spock set off in pursuit of a Section 31 ship that has failed to check in on schedule. When they catch up with the ship, they find most of the crew dead, all except one, Cameron Gant. Actor Ali Moman reprises his role as Gant, first seen in Season 1's The Vulcan Hello and Battle at the Binary Stars, where he was the tactical officer of the USS Shenzhou. It turns out, of course, that Gant is actually another personification of control, and he attacks Burnham, intending to turn her into another reconstruction to get access to the sphere data aboard Discovery. The nanobot recreations of people have me thinking this is less like the Borg and more like something from another science fiction franchise, the Replicators from Stargate. What do you think? Do you agree that there are similarities here? Let me know in the comments. In order to acquire a time crystal, Captain Pike must confront his future. As detailed in the original series episode The Menagerie Part 1, Fleet Captain Christopher Pike would be confined to a wheelchair and locked within his own mind following exposure to Delta radiation during an inspection of a J-class starship. Saving a number of Starfleet cadets in the process, Pike sacrificed himself for the safety of others. This event will happen approximately nine years after this Discovery episode, and we see these events play out for Pike on Boreth. This adds an interesting element to Pike's future, as he willingly makes the choice to remain on the path to this future in order to obtain the crystal, proving himself to be the embodiment of Federation values and one of the best examples of what it means to be a Starfleet officer. In Pike's vision of the future, we get a look at the uniform he wears as a fleet captain. It shares certain design elements with the flag officer uniforms of the Kelvin timeline, including rank epaulets showing his fleet captain rank. 
Speaking of the menagerie, in what I'm convinced is a very subtle nod to that episode, Jet Reno arrives in sickbay, complaining of a hangnail. In the menagerie, when Spock commits mutiny by illegally taking over the Enterprise, he summons Dr. McCoy back to the ship. Probably somebody discovered a hangnail. I'll beam up and let you know, Jim. Interestingly, Ensign Tilly, played by Mary Wiseman, does not appear in this episode. Apparently, Wiseman was unavailable for the filming of Through the Valley of Shadows, but presumably she will be returning next week for Such Sweet Sorrow, as it appears from the trailer that the upcoming episode will in some way involve the planet Zahea, whose queen was featured in the Tilly-centric Short Treks episode, Runaway. Well, that's all I found for Easter eggs in this episode. Were there any that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below. But before we get to the end of the video, here are some of your theories posted on the review for this week's episode. GDFLS says, Perhaps they incorporate the time crystal into Discovery and jump it to the future slash past into the nebula, where it will be hidden as seen in Calypso. But they fake the self-destruction, so it appears to Section 31 ships that it's gone for good. Yeah, I agree with this. I definitely think that the Short Treks episode Calypso is going to play a role, and I think that we are going to see in the next couple of episodes them hiding Discovery. I like bringing in the idea that they're going to fake the self-destruct for the benefit of Section 31, because you'd presumably think if Section 31, if, if Discovery's out there, Section 31 would find it, but maybe they absolutely believe that the ship is destroyed and unrecoverable. Cedar Hughes says, It's funny that you think it's less likely that Control is proto-Borg after this episode, because, being on the fence before, I now think the theory is a bit stronger after seeing those green nanites that were going to be injected into Michael. You also can't deny the visual callback to first contact with the needle going into the eye. Yeah, I do definitely think there are some very obvious visual similarities. I just the behavior of the nanites in this episode strikes me as very different from the way the Borg behave. We do know that the Borg use organic life and incorporate it into their technology for a melding and they strive for perfection between those two uh, elements of their physicality. But the AI in these episodes is dedicated to the extermination of all organic life, all sentient life. However, I do see a possible way I can definitely kind of suss out in my head how they would get from that to what we see of the Borg, and I'm definitely not discounting that as a possibility. I just personally don't think that that's the direction they're going in. I am very happy to be proven wrong, though. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I just at this point don't think that's the direction they're going to go, but I might be surprised, absolutely. Fanboyamus Prime says, I do wonder if there is a Borg connection in that control was made using Borg technology that ended up on Earth due to the events of First Contact, with even what happened in Enterprise wasn't good enough to keep some people from messing with that. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people online making this connection, and I absolutely agree that the nanites that control uses might very well be based on the Borg technology recovered in the Enterprise episode Regeneration, which was of course from the uh, bits of the Borg's fear that was destroyed by the Enterprise E in First Contact, could definitely see there being a connection there. So instead of the control AI going on to create the Borg in the past somehow, instead what it's become now is based on Borg technology from before. That's entirely possible and I think that's kind of a really neat connection there. Well, my theory this week has to do with the Short Treks episode Calypso, like so many other people have been theorizing out there. Like GDFLS, I do think they will fake the destruction of the Discovery and use it to transport the Time Crystal, acquired by Pike in this episode, into the future, where Michael Burnham's mother will take possession of it and repair the Red Angel suit. During this time, the AI known as Zora will evolve and play a pivotal role in the fight against Control. Now, when I say they use the Discovery to transport the Time Crystal, I don't mean that the Discovery is jumping into the future somehow. I think it's just like we saw in Calypso. They will fake its destruction and hide the ship somewhere away from the prying eyes of Control. In this way, Discovery will effectively be lost to the crew, necessitating a drastic change for Season 3, hence the reports that something game-changing will happen for the show at the end of this season. What that something is, I don't know. A new ship? A complete change of time period and setting? 
Season 3 taking place entirely on the Enterprise, with the Discovery crew moving to there. I don't know, and I can only speculate. Let me know your thoughts on this theory in the comments below, and throw some of your own thoughts and theories my way too. I love what some of you have come up with, and I can't wait to read more. Thanks to the Patreon supporters for your support of the channel. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone else for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more Star Trek as we close in on the final two episodes of Discovery Season 2. I can't believe how close we are to the end. I'm excited, but I also don't want it to end. I'll see you all in the next video, but until then, I honor you, Captain.